As we go to our worship today, or our proclamation today, you see that the scripture lesson comes from John uh, 19. Definitely go ahead and invite you to turn there or go there on your smartphone. You remember, as we said last week, go into your smartphone for the scripture reading does not look like this during the whole service. So just keep that on lock as we invite you to pull out your phone. Um, we'll be there in just a minute to give you some time, but uh, did you hear the children's time? Did everybody hear it? Uh, this is for real. I want you to interact with me as much as you can. Raise your hand for me. Have you ever said things that didn't have any real meaning? You ever just said nonsense? Yeah. Okay. Good job. Have you ever cut your brain out of the out of the whole equation and let some part of your heart just blurt something straight out of your mouth? Just don't raise it unless you really mean it. Have you ever used words that don't necessarily have anything to do with who you are, really, or what you really think, or just the general truth as you know it? Yeah, which is ridiculous. Go ahead. And, this is an everybody kind of time. How about this? Have you ever said the words, well, bless your heart? <laughs> What's up? Nikki Haley just did that. That was awesome. Um, yeah. Never, never true. So we're talking again about this kind of pathway from here to here um, and how it can be pretty sketchy sometimes. In a way, I think it's pretty amazing um, that we trust each other at all. It is amazing that communication happens because we know we can invent I can invent the most insane things and stick them out of my mouth and pass it off as reality or pass it off as my thoughts or pass it off as my heart and if I'm really good at it you're just not going to know right how do we get away with talking at all um, and some of us I think have developed a healthy are you somebody who puts pride in your healthy level or unhealthy level of cynic, cynical cynicism sorry or skepticism or doubt when it comes to what other people have to say. You don't have to raise your hand. My dad is somebody who prides himself on being able to spot, I'll say, mole jive. <laughs> um, and some of us do. We, we go there. Uh, we grow as people. We learn. Um, but an opening question for us today is to try to transition from all those feelings um, and to wonder how do we treat what God has to say? How do we treat the way that God speaks? Um, because I think we do sometimes apply all that cynical experience to Jesus and to faith and to what God has to say. The question is, do we apply all that reasoning to God's word? Or can we try to believe that God is different? God is supposed to be different. God's words to us are supposed to be a very, an utterly unique kind of communication with us. Because um, y'all, it's, it's, it's supposed to be different with God. Um, God. Does God have any need for deception? Does God have any need for deception? Does God need to have anything to hide? Does God have anything to fear? Does God have anything to prove? Does God need to be dishonest about anything? The answer is just no. No, no, no. Because God is God. Um, so can we believe that the distance between God's heart and mind and mouth, if you can say there is such a thing, it's kind of weird to think about God's mouth. It's weird. <laughs> Can we believe that there's no distance between those things? That there's no difference between them? That they're one? It's really cool. We hear that. We heard that in our discipleship series in week one. We talked about experiencing God's word. This idea that not only is God's word one and unified, God is kind of like one with God's word. And so when God speaks, what happens? Things happen. Things exist. When God spoke, creation existed. God said light and light came on. Okay, even more, Jesus is described in a really cool way as God's Word, as the Word, capital W. Okay, God's living Word. It's a weird, mystical part of God. It's this cool thing. We don't see that anywhere else in our experience on earth. The most trustworthy people you know get close. If you know people who really do mean exactly what they say. And I don't just mean like blunt honesty, right? I mean people who are sincere with their words. We get close. There's nothing like that, this sense of oneness. Um, we're going to try to wrap ourselves around that today. Um, and, and to do that a little bit, I want to share with you a song. Uh, there's a new album, fairly new, from a band called Hillsong United, Christian group uh, based out of Australia, all over the world. Awesome group, awesome music. Um, most recent album is called Empires. I think I shared with you a little bit of that before. Um, one of the tracks is called Say the Word. I want you to know that this album has become one of my soundtracks, especially like Saturday night anxious sermon preparation. 
right? So Karen's, my wife's here, she knows what's up. If I've got my headphones on, it's probably one of these albums. And this song in particular has been just blowing me up for a few months. And I've just had the sense that we're gonna, I was gonna preach about it and share it. Um, and I think today's the day. And so we're just gonna listen to, we're gonna listen together to the first two minutes, two and a half minutes of that song called Say the Word, Hillsong United from Empires. And if this is not what you usually do in church, or you're not a music person, sorry. You're a big part of the church. And we're just going to spend two and a half minutes. And I'm a music person, and I just wanted to wash over you. I want you to draw this in. There, the words are going to be on the screen. I want you to listen and pay attention. And this is starting to get us towards a sense of embracing God's Word. It's a really cool survey, in a way, of what Scripture has to say about God's Word. If you want to kick it up to the back. Just two and a half minutes. You don't need to go listen to the rest of the song, listen to the whole album. It'll blow up your life. Please do it. Or it should. It could. It's one of those things I'm almost scared to have us listen to songs like that because over months and months it's coming to mean a lot to me and I never know what it's going to mean to you as we kind of engage that together. But it's, it is a great summary of the way that Scripture treats God's Word. And it's a great personal witness to the way we can treat God's Word together. Um, from the grand things like creation and the stars, the way that God speaks things into being, down to the very personal, as God speaks to our hearts, as our lives hang on every word He speaks. It's awesome. Um, and it's really pertinent because uh, that last line there comes from our scripture reading today. Um, our goal together um, is just to start small and, and just to try to take God at His word in Christ Jesus today, on Easter Sunday, we're going to start really small with just kind of one of the tiniest but most significant things that Jesus ever said uh, in John 19. If you want to go there, if you're ready. We're actually going to focus on verses 25 through 30. And really pay attention to the last, last verse, uh, which gives us uh, the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. as recorded by John. It's a big deal. It says, Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, this is at the crucifixion, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to, to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill Scripture, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, and so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And it's not clear we're focusing on that sense of it is finished. It is finished. Famous words, famous last words. Um, we know that the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, record in one way or another what happened here. Most of them record that Jesus gave a final cry or said some final things before giving up his spirit. John, who we know is one of the few who was actually there, one of the eyewitnesses, um, standing there with Jesus' mother, um, wrote down what he heard Jesus say, which is, it is done, it is finished. Um, a great way to kind of think about that, to remember it, and something we're going to work with today, um, comes from the Greek word for what he said, the phrase. It's actually one word that represents those three little words. One word that comes to us as it is finished. It's tetelestai. All right, I'm going to have you repeat that back to me. Tetelestai. We got it. Tetelestai. It's not easy. Sorry. It's a little stuttery in there. Tetelestai. Okay, it means it is done. It is finished. We're going to work with that today. Um, why do we need to work on taking Jesus at his word on this? Um, I think because on this Easter Sunday, um, it reminds us of the just absolute core of our faith. The absolute core of the Christian faith. And I think really there are two simple truths that most of us overlook in life. It's a big deal, Christians and not. Um, this is a big one for us today. The first, 
first thing that we need to try to not overlook, the first thing is, if we take Jesus at his word, is that he implies that something needed finishing. Okay? For him to say it's finished, it implies to us that something first needed finishing. All right, so go ahead and give me a big duh. So say duh for me. Get, put your heart into it. Say it like your mama just said something really obvious. Okay, good job. All right, that's going to be the first duh of the day. But it's not a duh. It's not a duh for us. Because my point is this. Our culture in, in certain parts of our hearts and certain parts of our human nature have a knack for telling us that faith is no more than kind of a sideline to life. Yeah? Faith is kind of this non-committal, optional, nice thing to sprinkle over your life. If it adds some kind of meaning for you, that's great. If it gives you some value, whatever it looks like, faith is that nice thing to kind of add to life. It's like the mashed potatoes on a plate. You heard that message before? It's pretty common. Um, we get this message um, sometimes that really it's not that faith is an urgent or a credible thing. That faith uh, really boils down to, uh, guess what? Words, right? So somebody's ideas some time ago or a, a group of people's ideas like just a bunch of words on the pages of an ancient book from a long time ago. It's how we treat faith in our culture. Um, and that's an important thing for us to wrestle with because it teaches us that faith is something that we can get along without. And it maybe is a nice supplement, again, the mashed potatoes. And that takes us to a special place. That the assumption that that builds in us, I, I think, agree or disagree, is that it would be nuts, it is nuts, insane, nuts to think that we might have some kind of problem that needed solving so bad that only God could come and fix it. That's nuts. It's a big part of our culture and our hearts and our human nature. That we could have a problem that sin could be such a real thing that only God could come. That somebody else would have to step in and fix it for us. It's nuts. Our conclusion sometimes with all that is some, some really deep questions. We ask ourselves things like, what did Jesus really need to finish for us? A big one for folks, I talk to friends about this a lot all the time when we talk about Easter Sunday and the crucifixion. Why did Jesus have to do that? Why do y'all go to all that blood and guts, torture, torment, punishment, death on the cross? Why did he need to do that? Nothing needed finishing, we say to ourselves sometimes. Uh, but we just need to, we need to be able to admit together that it's not a duh thing. And when Jesus says something needed finishing, implies that. He needs to challenge us a little bit. Why does it need to challenge us? Because John, Jesus' words in John tell us that something was up. So to go back to to tell us time. You ready? It is finished. It had a really cool meaning in the ancient world. Um, so yes, literally it means it is finished. But in the ancient world, it also had a cool everyday use, which was that when people uh, bought a product or paid for something or a service, and they turned in their receipt, the person who sold them the product would write to Telestine on their little note. They didn't have receipt machines or like online receipts and paperless and all that stuff, right? And so if you ordered something, you bought something, whatever, you had your little payment done and the, the seller, the vendor would write to Telestine. They might write TET and abbreviate it. It was like the stamp. And what I'm saying is it had this very cool sense in Jesus' day of paid in full. That our debt has been paid in full. And that sounds a lot nearer to a core basic Christian definition of what Christ did as he served as our enduring sacrifice. As he served as the one who paid our debts. As he served as the one who was a ransom to redeem us. And we get the sense that Jesus knew about Tetelestai. He was what by trade? What he learned from his dad. He was a carpenter. And so we have this vision that as Jesus grew up before his ministry, when people came to him and said, hey man, thanks for the roof. Thanks for the table. I don't know what Jesus made. He's probably a good carpenter, right? He was Jesus. Uh, thanks for the cabinets. They showed him the bill. They paid the bill. And he would write, what? It's done. We are done. 
debt paid. We're all squared away. This is part of what informed Christ's person, his life. And I think it's exactly a part of what he had in mind when he said this on the cross. And we've already talked last week about how tough it was for him to pull himself up by his wounds to speak. And so we can assume that his words were intentional because everyone counted and hurt him. And he felt the need to say this to us out loud. Paid in full. Done. Finished. And we have to be able to admit that if he has said that out loud, we've heard those words spoken, we can't unhear them. The universe cannot unhear that. So we have to reckon with it. Even if we don't like it, even if we feel like faith is secondary or senseless or who knows what, Jesus said this. And if he was in his right mind, he knew that he was. And if he was real, if this happened, and if he said this, and if he was who he claimed he was, we have to wonder what needed finishing. Did something need finishing? What did he need to finish for me? We've got to start there today. Um, the second thing is that if we take Jesus at his word today, um, not only did something apparently need finishing, but who finished it? Who finished it? That's another easy one, guys. Who finished it? Jesus finished it. So go ahead and say, duh. duh. Give me a good one. Duh. duh. And some of y'all are it's too natural. <laughs> I'm on the back. Yeah, I see the parents. Uh, yep. If we take Jesus at his word, not only does something need finishing, but Jesus finished it. Why is that important? Um, I want you to be honest again and raise your hands. Is there anybody in the house who has a hard time stopping trying to earn God's love? One way or another. And be as honest as you will be. Is there anybody in the house who feels like you have to fix your stuff before you can come to God or come back to God. You've got to get it all done first. Prerequisite. Is there anybody in the, in the house who has a hard time forgiving yourself for, for something? You might in the house who has a hard time forgiving yourself in general just as a person. Is there anybody in the house who thinks you're the unforgivable person in the house? Are there any of us in the house who have a hard time feeling like we're indebted to someone else? That we owe somebody something. Is there any, so a lot of y'all aren't the same people raising their hands. <laughs> Is there anybody in the house uh, who prefers to, to handle things themselves when it comes to our problems? Is there anybody in the house who prefers to be in control? There's some smiles, some little, some bashful raises. Yes, these are, we all raise our hands kind of things. We have a hard time. You can dub me all you want. But we have a hard time believing that what Jesus did is done. That when he says it is done, it is actually done. We have a hard time letting it be finished. We feel like we have to add to. We feel like there's just a little bit extra that I might need to do to supplement his cross. We feel like there's just that extra thing that maybe he didn't know I was going to do when he died at the time. And I don't think it's finished yet. Or we struggle with our sinfulness even though we're Christian people and, and redeemed and it still continues and it doesn't feel finished yet. Uh, in other words, we built up, I think, our own version, our kind of man-made, woman-made stuff, system of stuff in opposition to what Jesus really has to say. Really strong uh, viral video that came out a few years ago by a guy named Jefferson Bethke. Um, he kind of, it's a poem that he kind of wraps, so I'm going to do my best to kind of straddle the line between reading this and rapping it. Go with me, is that okay? Yeah, we'll see. Um, he describes this relationship between religion and really Jesus, and how Jesus is superior to religion. He says, Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. One is the work of God, one is a man-made invention. One is the cure, and one is a part of the infection. Because religion says do, and Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says daughter or son. Religion puts you in shackles, but Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus lets you see. This is what makes religion and Jesus two different clans. Religion is man searching for God. And Christianity is God searching for man. 
which is why salvation is freely mine. Forgiveness is my own, not based on my efforts, but Christ's obedience alone. Because he took the crown of thorns and blood that dripped down his face, he took what we all deserve, but that's why we call it grace. While, be, while being murdered, he yelled, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Because when he was dangling on that cross, he was thinking of you. He paid for all your sin and then buried it in the tomb, which is why I'm kneeling at the cross now, saying, come on, there's room. So know this, that I hate religion. In fact, I literally resent it. Because when Jesus cried, it is finished, I believe that he meant it. He's talking about, woo, he's talking about all that stuff that we build, all that stuff of ours that we build, that we let take the place of the actual living Christ. And all those words and things that we cling to, instead of listening to and believing those three little words to tell us that, that it is done. It is already done. Stop trying to do it. It's a big deal. Uh, as we close, I want you to wrestle with both of those, those things. That something needed doing and that it's been done, that Jesus did it. It doesn't mean that we're done in our lives on earth. Uh, amen? We're not done. Okay, if Jesus finished it, we just get to go home and chill and it's all good. See you in heaven. Enjoy the hand today, right? No, because as much as something needed to be done, uh, something needed finishing, Jesus finished it, we're not finished here. We're not finished in life. Um, just because kind of the bill has been paid, right? Paid in full. This is not one of those things where somebody takes to care of the check. Sweet. Our obligations are over. See you later. Because we're Easter people. And so after Jesus died and paid that debt, he also decided to still show up again and walk out of the tomb. And he did that to continue a relationship with us now that we're free. And this is life. This is everything that comes after the debt being paid. Time with Him and communion with Him for the rest of our lives forever. Okay, and that's, that's very cool. Um, but it's the beginning of a relationship. So we're not done together. We're called to continue being disciples together. You're going to need a faith community to do that because it's not easy. It's easy to go back right back to religion. We need people around us to remind us what Jesus actually said, that it's done. And we need to grow as disciples. And maybe some of us need to consider what it is to, to become a disciple for the first time. Because y'all, we are Easter people. We're not just people of some ancient words. We're not even just people of the book. We're people of the book, but we're not just people of the book. We're people of the word, the living word. That is still alive. Amen? So just want, want you to wrestle with that. When he says it is done, it is done. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know what it is to doubt sometimes that you existed, that you came at all. We know what it is to doubt that you needed to come, that sin is real. Father, even just probably a few minutes of experience on earth, just an experience of ourselves might be enough to teach us that sin is real and that our nature is to run after all hell and death and Satan and nothing good for us and nothing good for your people. So Father, convince us, convict us of what it is that we needed something finished for us and that it's more than just kind of an add-on bonus to life, our faith, but that it is everything. In the same breath, we know what it is to try to fix it ourselves, to try to finish it ourselves. To try to deliver ourselves and define ourselves. We build up so much nonsense religion that has nothing to do with you. We confess it. Lord, help us to trust that your sacrifice was enough. That there is nothing we can add to it. And there's nothing we can do that it wasn't enough for. As we try to trust that it is finished. And Father, last we do pray for what it is to yet to be people who live and struggle on earth as you're called and redeemed people, as your disciples. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.